So this is part two of the mid-century modern um, style modular storage rack slash wine display. Um, it's not in the intro frame because I actually have it in pieces around my shop because I've started finishing it this morning. But I decided to put this guy in the frame because anybody that watches the channel will recognize this from a couple videos back. Um, it was a little different then because it didn't have this second drawer. Um, the customer decided once she saw the finished piece that she wanted it to have two drawers instead of the open shelving. Luckily, the way I built this, it was extremely easy to order the same hardware and I had the spacing perfect. The way I built it was identical to how I built the top. So it was easy enough to add the drawer, but that means it's been sitting in my shop for a little bit of time because those bloom undermount drawer slides, they don't sell them in stores by me, so I always have to order them. And ordering stuff nowadays, it, it everything just comes slowly. But um, I managed to finish it up, and it's got all the coats of finish on it. So I thought it was nice that people could see the finished, finished product of this. Like I said, it's the, the two drawers, the bloom undermount slides. The top's not fully connected yet. And um, for the modular piece, like I said, I'm, I'm working on finishing it around my shop. Totally 100% appreciate all the comments I got about the, the hard wax finishes. I'm the type of person that, um, I wouldn't say I hem and haw about stuff, but I really like to research things before I do it, especially when it's furniture for someone else. If this goes to someone's house and the finish I put on it isn't as good as stuff as I've, as I've done before, I don't want a phone call down the road saying that it's scratched or chipped or anything like that. So I really appreciate everyone's um, stories and experiences with those finishes. This was going to be a two-part series, but unfortunately the footage I had was a little too long for one video. It would have been over 20 minutes and I don't like to do videos that are too long. So I'm breaking it up into two parts. So the finishing will be in the third video and this one's mostly going to be finishing up this, the, the skeletal structure and, and doing parts of, of the build like that. So before I glued these boxes together, I went through and put a 45 degree bevel on the front edge of all of the pieces. If you're making mid-century modern furniture for a customer, this is kind of a hallmark design element in the pieces, especially when it's some sort of cabinetry. They, they front bevel that edge. It is an extra step, but as a design element, it does really look nice on the piece. I've done this with different degrees. I've done 15, I've done 30. On this one, I've, I did 45, and I like them all. Um, I was just trying to try something a little bit different. And then also, once, the, once the, that front bevel was done, I put a half inch dado stack in, the, in, the, in my table saw, and I put a half inch rabbit on the back side to receive the half inch plywood I'm using for this. Um, the backer could have been quarter inch, but I happen to have half inch laying around, so it won't hurt it uh, being a little bit heavier. So then for the shelving, um, I've done this process before. It's a little more involved, but it worked out nicely. Because this shelving will have a stretcher on top on the back of the shelf and on bottom on the, the front of the shelf, um, I like to put dovetails in there to hold the whole piece together, but you have to make sure the offset's correct. So I made up a little jig. I used, I believe this is set a seventh ace bushing and then a 14 degree dovetail bit. And then I could go through and add dovetails in the back using that jig so they're perfect on both pieces. Now, on, when I've done this process before, I've went through and removed the bulk of the material with a straight cutting bit. Since I only had four of these to do, I didn't do that because that involves setting up two different routers. So for this one, I just slowly, slowly uh, ate away at the material and I didn't have a problem bogging down the router. So you can see with the offset of the bushing and the jig, it makes the perfect piece. It comes right up to the line that I wanted, which is the thickness of the, the rail I'm putting in the back and then I could do the other one as well. I could switch this jig to, to the other side and do that one also. Now, on the piece I made previously, I put dovetails in the front as well. I didn't want to do that on this one because the front is angled. You could see when they go on top of each other, they line up perfectly. So for the front of this, um, I'm doing mortises. So before I did that, I put um, a rough cut 
a dovetail to make sure it's right. Like I said, this is a 14 degree bit, so this is pretty simple. I set the blade at 14 degrees, I do a couple test pieces, and then I could cut those rails. So that's what the dovetails in the back look like. You can see everything lines up with my marks. And then the top mark will have where the bottom stretcher goes, accounting for the thickness of the ply. There's only a little gap in that one because you have to sh slightly shave off the back edge of that dovetail because it's a rounded over bit. And like I said, the front is going to be mortise and tenon, and uh, my camera slowly falls, falls over in this, but I'm using the radial arm saw to make those tenons. You can see my, both of my rails are going to be the exact same width and then I could go through and cut those mortises. So this is what the mortise in the front looks like. And like I said, I chose to do it that way because of the angle, doing a dovetail with the angle, it would have looked a little weird and I would have had to have a very thick piece of material. So I, I kind of compromised and used, used mortise and tenon. All I did was use the exact same bevel with the exact same angle. I put some pencil marks on the bevel so I could transfer the pencil marks to the piece and then that mortise will be in the exact same spot for all of them. So you can see the mark I made. I'm going to plow out the bulk of the material with a 3 8 inch Faulkner bit, a spade bit, and then I could use a chisel just to clean up that joint. It's a super simple way to make mortise and tenons. So the nice thing is I'll have that dovetail on the back side of this piece that will hold it together. That's why I like to do dovetails. And in the front, I'll still have a very solid joint but it is a little bit different with, with uh, being mortise and tenon. So then I could just test fit that tenon in there, and this stuff all fit pretty well right off, off the table, so I didn't have much finagling to do to get this stuff to fit. So then with those pieces on bottom still dry fitted together, I could go through and put, push these, these in as well. So the mortise is nice it kind of you know, there's enough given this that I could fit those into place and then fit the dovetails in the back you can see with those dovetails just how well they'll hold this whole thing together so the dovetailed one in the back is higher than the, than the front and then that plywood slides in between the two of them um, I was kind of working on all of this in tandem so now I could glue up my boxes you can see I have my tall uh, fence on my, my table saw to kind of hold them in place. I'm using ratchet straps to glue these together. I've used multiple different things. I, these boxes were small enough I could get away with using ratchet straps, which is the easiest way to do it. Um, if you have corners for your ratchet straps, that works a little bit better. You have to be careful if you don't have the corners and you, you ratchet these too much, they'll actually dent the edges of your plywood box. So I had to glue up both of those one at a time. So I just rough cut some plywood and you can see now visu visually uh, what, what I was saying by how those front and back are offset. And then the way I like to attach these, it's a little tedious, but I like to put um, an eighth inch groove in all of my pieces and add a spline and then a groove in the plywood as well. It just really shores up the piece. This mid-century modern stuff is pretty thin lumber, so you do want it to be really structural or it's going to move around on you a lot. So once it's back in place, I can mark where that groove is. I could put the plywood on top and then transfer those marks to the plywood so I know where to cut the grooves in the plywood. You can see how I just have it on top there. Now I lost the footage for a little bit here, but like I said earlier, I made a piece very similar to this in the fall. I still have the footage. So this is older footage, but it's the exact same process. So the marks are on the wrong side of the piece. When you mark them in place, I transfer them to the opposite sides and then just cut the groove. The splines, just half inch poplar I had laying around. So you could see now how that, that plywood panel will fit into, into the spline. And then this will hold the whole thing in place. So that's what that looks like. And it's a hidden joint too. You don't see any hardware or screws or anything like that, which is one of the main reasons I decided to, to do it that way, as well as being extremely strong. Once that's done, I could go through and edge band all of that plywood. So this is just walnut edge banding. I could go through and do the whole piece. I like to do the sides first and then the fronts so you don't get a seam um, in that edge banding on the front edge of the piece. 
edge banding is not, I say this every time I, I film it for a video, it's not my most favorite thing to do. Um, working with working with this walnut veneer ply in general is not my most favorite because like I like I say in, in all the videos, it's the veneer is just so thin. So then this is uh, uh, current footage, it will flip back to old footage again, but this is the current footage of, of gluing this together, so pretty self-explanatory. The bottoms I glued, I think, at the exact same time. I might have glued them the day before, but I usually keep this stuff separated pretty far into the build process because a lot of times you have to take these parts apart in order to cut joinery. It just makes it easier when it's when it's in sections, so I didn't glue that up till the end. And then this is once again stepping back into old footage because I don't have, my camera died when I was adding the plies, but it's the exact same process. You could see you put glue in those those dovetails. The, the original piece had dovetails in the front and the back. Glue in the spline. I could pop these into place. Put the spline in there as well. And then uh, just put glue in the plywood and attach that as well. So you could see just how sturdy and how much surface area these joints have. And then glue on the spline and then I could pop that plywood plywood piece into place. So like I said, this is a lot more involved than, than other methods, but something like this will, will never come apart. And then this is, once again, flipping back to current footage. That's what it looked like all glued up. Sometimes it takes a little bit of clamping to, to get those splines in this, into place. And then this is what it looked like pretty much together before I took it apart uh, to put the finish on. And that will be the last video.